Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm looking at Tudor rebellions again and in this video I'm looking in particular at religious causes as a theme. So in terms of my students doing your A-level coursework and you're looking at, at the causes of all the different Tudor rebellions, this is one of the, the one of the sections, one of the themes that you'd have within your essay. Now religious causes are going to be very very important for some rebellions and less so for others. It, it, in terms of a theme, one of the things it, 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 it poses a bit of a problem for us in terms of coverage because it isn't really an issue uh, in the early part under Henry VII, but it becomes increasingly uh, an issue as we go through, particularly after the split with Rome in the 1530s under Henry VIII. Now, through this period, you have got essentially two branches of Christianity in Western Europe. Now, the original and dominant uh, form of Christianity in Western Europe, including in England, uh, was, was the Catholic Church. Uh, and what we will see that the development of the Tudor period is key divisions over religion between Catholics and Protestants. Now, Protestants actually get their name from the word, from the fact that they protested against what they saw as the corruption in the Catholic Church uh, and the belief that the Catholic Church had moved away from its original uh, teachings and roles. And they looked at things like uh, indulgences when people could essentially give the church money to to bypass uh, periods of, uh, of time in purgatory and, and things like that. And they saw the increments uh, wealth of the church and they saw the corruption and, 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 and poor behaviour of some priests and, and some monks and all that kind of and all those things that were going on. And they said, right, the church has gone wrong and we protest about the direction it's gone in and we want to change it and we want to interpret um, the, what the Bible says and, and the way that the uh, churches should be presented and, and what should happen in terms of church services and all these different things should be done differently. Now, the, the Protestantism really starts to grow with it and, and the birth of it is seen as the, the publication of, um, of Martin Luther, a German monk, of his 95 theses in 1517. As you'll see, this is a, this is a chunk of a way through our time period. So you're, you're, in, you're, you're into the reign of Henry VIII when this comes out. Now, there had been protests against the, the church before this, um, so there had been some earlier movements in England, such as the Lollards back in the 14th century, who followed uh, the reformer John Wycliffe. And they, again, they, they very much they pointed out the, the problems with corruptions and other difficulties with the church. Other religious changes that we see during this period, in, in the reign of Henry VII, we've seen the growth of something known as humanism. Uh, which was a line of thought within the within Catholicism that that saw education as the key towards creating a utopian world. Eh? The idea you ultimately humanity could get better and better and better and essentially create heaven on earth. Um, and these ideas feed through into the reigns of the other Tudors and they can be connected in some ways uh, into some of the ideas of the Reformation. They, they definitely play a key role in, in what is uh, known as the Renaissance, which is, is, is kind of the rebirth of, of classical teachings and classical ideas and, and subjects. Uh, and, and in that, they, they play an important role. And as, as people are better educated, they, then that does feed into great debate on issues such as uh, religion. So England, at the beginning of our time period in Tudor England, is a Catholic country. Uh, and by the end of our period, will be a Protestant country. Now, it, things vary as, as we go through in terms of where exactly it is at different points in time. And, and one of the things I've often thought about is it must have been, particularly in the mid Tudor period, it must have been quite a confusing time as, as an ordinary member of society where religion was really important to you, but what you were told to do in terms of religious practices kept changing. So whilst in the modern era, um, in modern Britain, people would have a choice of which church to attend or, or to not attend, or and, and obviously have a multi a multi faith um, country now. But back then, essentially, all the churches would have followed um, the, the the religion that was um, the position of the monarch at the time. So it wasn't simply the case that the Catholics would go to a Catholic church and Protestants could go to a Protestant church and everybody would be happy. When we had Catholic monarchs, all the churches were Catholic. When we had Protestant monarchs, all the churches were Protestant. And the other groups tended to be persecuted um, by the uh, respective monarchs for, for their beliefs. And we, we see that particularly uh, under Mary and then uh, also 
under some of the other monarchs, for example, on Henry VIII and, and, and Edward and Elizabeth. So Henry VII was Catholic, as, as essentially everybody was uh, during that period of time in, in England, uh, 1485 to 1509. And, and Henry VIII is a really interesting one. So initially, Henry VIII it, it appears to be very, very strongly um, Catholic. In fact, writes in a, t a book attacking the ideas of Luther and is given the title Defender of the Faith by the Pope. But he then splits from the Catholic Church in, in 1534. And so from that point onwards, we can see a, a, a kind of sort of movement towards Protestantism. But I would argue, and, and, and many others would agree, that, that really Henry VIII himself is always essentially um, a Catholic. So even though he spoke from the Catholic Church, in terms of his, his doctrine and his beliefs about, um, about religion, that, that he essentially was Catholic. His son Edward, however, wasn't. Uh, he, Edward is very clearly Protestant, and one of the major things that he does in his reign is he pushes the English church back towards Protestantism very strongly. In fact, he gets frustrated with the Duke of Somerset, who he believes isn't acting quickly enough. And then there are further reforms uh, under Northumberland. Uh, we then move to his half-sister, Mary, who is very, very strongly um, Catholic, and she tries to restore or does restore the power of the Catholic Church in England. And she is known as Bloody Mary because of her uh, pursuit of Protestants who opposed her. And, and we see this as illustrated in Fox's Book of Martyrs. And we, we, we see the around 300 um, Protestants who are uh, burnt alive uh, for their beliefs, which Fox then goes into it's a great kind of detail explaining. And Mary, therefore, is identified uh, for the, this action as as Bloody Mary. Now, you could argue in terms of <laughs> the bloodthirstiness, whether not more of the Tudors shouldn't have that that kind of uh, addition to their names. But part of that is, is the rest of English history is going to be Protestant history. And therefore, Mary tends to get singled out. Uh, and though and her actions were, were definitely very, very extreme. But interestingly, there isn't a massive Protestant revolt against Mary because still at this point of time, the vast, vast majority of the population are Catholic. Now, Elizabeth is also Prot is Protestant like her younger, younger half brother, Edward, and she creates a Protestant church. And, and it is the Elizabethan church, the, the Church of England that she creates, which is it is largely the one that, that we still have today in terms of the, the modern day Church of England and, and a lot of the the, the ideology and doctrine and, and practices that are put in during the reign of Elizabeth had, had survived for a very, very long time afterwards. Now, going into Elizabeth's um, reign, then, although we had had variation amongst the monarchs, it was very clear that the vast, vast majority of the English people were Catholic. Now, there was pockets of Protestantism, particularly in the south and the east of England, in, in London and Kent and East Anglia. But largely, the vast majority of the, the population was Catholic. And even in those areas, there was large numbers of Catholic people. So what tends to change is the monarch. And therefore, the, the, the Protestant monarchs and on the monarchs who go against the Catholic Church, so Henry VIII, Edward and Elizabeth, are most likely to, to, to face a degree of religious rebellion because their views don't necessarily match that of all the people. Now, by the end of Elizabeth's reign, you could argue that England had properly become a Protestant country and actually Catholicism by then is associated with foreign and foreign powers like Spain and potential invasion and things that are un-English and unpatriotic. And so Protestantism does then eventually become um, dominant, though not completely, as, as if any of you have ever uh, looked at um, uh, this, the reign of James I and know about Guy Fawkes and the gunpowder, gunpowder plot, will know that kind of moves to try and take England back to being Catholic continued uh, after the Tudor period as well. So in terms of rebellion and, and uh, discontent, it, how strong a, a, a motive is religion? So uh, whenever the church was Catholic or Protestant, then those who had the opposite view were always likely to oppose the monarch. So if you have a Catholic monarch, then the Protestants are more likely to get involved in rebellious uh, activity. If you've got a, a Protestant monarch, then the Catholics are more likely to, to get involved in rebellious activity. And obviously there are more Catholics through the vast majority of this time period than there are Protestants. Religion was a very, very significant part of people's lives. 
and there were those who were willing to die for their faith and their convictions. So for everybody, it was an important part of, of, of the of the kind of the, the way of life. It was um, so you went to church on a Sunday. The um, it, the kind of the calendar year was built around religious festivals and religious uh, celebrations. The major points in, in in your life were punctuated by key involvement with the church, be that through kind of baptism and confirm and, and marriage and uh, and going to mass and then uh, going on to um, to funerals and then prayers for the dead and and all those kind of things. So, so this was part of the rhythm of everybody's life. Now, some of those bits are much more significant in Catholicism, so things like prayers for the death, because, dead because of belief in purgatory. Um, and and we, there are huge arguments over um, communion or mass, as, it, as it's known by the two different groups. So we see some fairly major changes, and, and this must have been very disruptive for people um, who were going through it. And people were, for for various reasons, very strongly resistant to change or very strongly demanding a great deal of change. Now, Elizabeth actually faced opposition from both Catholics and Protestants because the Catholics disliked the fact that she, she was Protestant and many Protestants felt that her reforms didn't go far enough. So we, we actually, uh, in Elizabeth, see an example of a monarch who can't fully please either side, though you can argue that ultimately she, she does a very good job in finding the, this kind of route that, that is Protestant, but it is, is moderately Protestant, allowing were what are known as church papists, so people who were who, who were Catholic but could find enough about Elizabeth's church that they didn't need to go against it and rebel against it. As religion was important to the lives of people in the Tudor period, then then whatever your actual grievances or actually your, your reason for pushing for rebellion is, it, it, it is tuning into or, or raising religious grievances was as always a good way of increasing support for your rebellion. And this is always something to question. If you're looking so the key people who were starting that rebellion, are they doing it for religious reasons or do they use religious reasons to get the ordinary people, to get the masses, the, the, the big numbers involved that are going to make the rebellion more effective? And so sometimes religion is absolutely the key factor and other times religious symbolism is used and the religion is used to increase support, but it isn't necessarily the core reason why that rebellion actually happens. And with all things, people, there's always going to be degrees of discontent at different points in time. So if we concentrate on the reign of Henry VII, again, in terms of the, the, there isn't a, a kind of religious rebellion in the time of Henry VII. Uh, largely because he predates the Reformation. Um, so there's very little in terms of religious involvement in it. There was, was some discontent with the church. There was some anti-clericalism where people disliked some of the practices of the clergy and the way that they behaved. And uh, and some they'd be absent from parishes. They they would have multiple jobs. Um, they would maybe not act in, in, in the most um, appropriate manners. Uh, and they might not be the best educated. They might they they might not be really up to the job. And and so, and there was various things going on in monasteries and things like that. And so there was some kind of anti-clericalism. But again, it wasn't hugely marked. It wasn't a, a a massive issue. The major religious change that's going forward in in um, the reign of Henry the Seventh is is part of the Renaissance, which is is the growth of humanism, which is particularly. Uh, pushed in, in England with the visit of Erasmus, who, who, who was a, a humanist scholar from uh, who was Dutch. So this was initially in 1499, and he came and he taught at Oxford uh, University between 1504 and 1506. Now, humanism promoted education. This, in a way, can be seen to have fed into Protestantism uh, as as you as you expand and improve education, then more people be able, to, be able to understand religious ideas and are able to question the teaching and practices of the church, and and also as more people could read, they des more people desired to be able to read the Bible, and a lot of those people wanted to be able to read it in their own language and felt to spread the word to others, then people needed to understand it, so they should be hearing it in their own language. Um, humanism, however, does not necessarily lead to Protestantism. In fact, humanism continues as a tradition through the Catholic Church. Thomas More in the reign of Henry VIII was a, a, a really significant and an important humanist who's actually executed for Henry VIII for not accepting the act of supremacy. So 
Humanism is an important staging post in all of this, but but and, and there are themes which run through into Protestantism, but they are not the same thing, and not all humanists go on to become Protestants. Now, as as we said, Henry VIII was raised in, in it, it was was raised with humanist ideas, and was a devout Catholic. Um, and, and he took a very strong stance initially against the ideas of Martin Luther, and we, we, we see this in the reign of Henry VIII with the burning of Lutheran uh, text. He's given um, the title Defender of the Faith by the Pope for his, his book that he wrote against Luther. Um, several um, groups of people, mostly in the universities, who were suspected of having Protestant sympathies were arrested and punished. So Henry seems to have been very anti-Protestant. Um, then we get the, the great matter, the thing that the, the, the pivot of everything in, in the Tudor period uh, with, with the, the divorce um, from Catherine of Aragon and, and the, the, the marriage to Anne Boleyn and the split from the Roman Catholic Church and Henry setting himself up as the, the head of Church of England. Uh, and this caused many much anger amongst Catholics. And the, the, there is we're going to go and look at the major rebellion, which is Pilgrimage of Grace. But there is. There's more discontent than that. I mean, predating that, we've got the story of Elizabeth uh, Barton, the nun of Kent, and it's a really interesting one where she has visions and she she actually um, tells the king that if he remarries, then then essentially he'll be dead within a month. And there's there's then all kinds of stuff that was built up around her. I mean, it, it, to to try and to try and push this kind of um, the, the Catholic uh, viewpoint and oppose the changes to the church that Henry is making. And, and she is one example of several. The dissolution of the monasteries made things worse. Um, and, and again, they played not only religious uh, reasons behind that, they played a very really important social, uh, social and economic role as well. Uh, and there were those who, who believed that Henry and his ministers were, were plundering the church and, and moving towards uh, this movement, movement towards Protestantism was something that they needed to raise up, uh, up to resist. Um, so th there is religious causes behind discontent uh, in the reign of Henry VIII, particularly um, as the great matter takes hold. The most significant form of this is the Pilgrimage of Grace in, in, in 1536. Uh, and in this, we see several kind of key indicators of religious um, involvement. So, with the pilgrims adopt the banner of the five wounds of Christ, uh, they protested against the dissolution of the monasteries. Um, there, there was fears, particularly in Lincolnshire, about parish churches uh, being shut down. That church plate was going to be taken by the government and 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 melted down. So, there's lots of things about the church and 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 religion that they thought was under threat. And they believed that were well, heretics, in, heretics people go against religious orthodoxy. So in this case, uh, Protestants uh, who were being in, uh, encouraged with, not effectively dealt with by by Henry and his ministers. Um, the, the Act of Ten Articles in July 36 was a, aimed at reducing some of these fears, though it's not fully successful. We will see the the, uh, the the Act of Six Articles later on, which is kind of more reinforcing Catholic ideas. Many suspected that, that key figures, particularly Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Cramner uh, and others in the King Council were heretics. And so so that, again, is part of the reason. And, and kind of freeing Henry from these heretic ministers was one of the key aims of a lot of the pilgrims. And they wanted to stop the government intervention in, in the, the religious practices that, that a lot of the ordinary people held dear. So the, the things like the Holy Days, pilgrimages, um, saints' relics. So these things had come under attack and, and they blamed Cromwell in particular for these religious changes. And, and so he was the focus of popular uh, anger. Now, Edward is um, is Protestant. He He's raised with Protestant ideas. In fact, Cramner his, is his uh, godfather. Uh, and um, so unsurprisingly, um, the young king brought in religious reform. Uh, and this is included a, a new prayer book. Uh, and equally unsurprisingly, there was a huge amount of opposition. And th this is di displayed with the, uh, the Western Rebellion in 1549, also known as the Prayer Book Rebellion. Now, 13 of the 14 demands made by um, those involved in the Western Rebellion were religious. And there were things like rejecting the new prayer book, rejecting the idea of an English Bible uh, and, and the, the use of an English Bible. Um, they wanted to, to revise the liturgy in terms of what, what the 
the priest said in, 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 in church, they demanded the return of papal relics and images and chantries. So chantries that are like small churches where where prayers for the dead are said, which is a key part of Catholic practice at the time in terms of speeding people through purgatory. Uh, they wanted two, at least two monasteries in every county. Uh, they wanted the return of Latin mass. They, they wanted um, it to be bread only, so communion in one kind rather than communion in both kinds, which was the practice in Protestantism, sorry, in Catholicism. At this point in time, um, the, the laity, the ordinary people, only received bread. Uh, whilst under the Protestant uh, practice, they received bread and wine. In, in the Catholic practice, only the priests uh, received the wine, the clergy. And they wanted to see a, a return to the six articles of, of 1539. And again, this was an area where Edward had made some significant change, went on to make some significant changes. Now, Ketch Rebellion is normally seen as, as a socio-economic one. But then, I mean, arguably, there is, is some, some religious elements to it. What is surprising about this is, is actually they seem to have not only fully embraced the king's religious reforms, um, but they actually felt the rate of change was in fact too slow and, and reform should go further. So there was really some quite radical Protestants uh, involved in, in parts of Ketz's rebellion. Now actually their demands for more radical Protestant reform is it's something that actually Edward would have agreed with and, and does partly explain some of the, um, the rebels' misplaced faith that actually uh, Edward was going to take their side rather than crush the rebellion, which is what he did. In Mary's reign, again, religion is, is, is the hot topic, particularly with her return um, to the Catholic Church and her persecution of Protestants. Now, the major rebellion against her, Wyatt's rebellion, was focused on, on her marriage to, to King Philip of Spain. Um, now, the fact that the rebellion was in Kent, where Protestantism was strong and, and against a Catholic monarch in, and actually proposed, uh, proposed replacing a Catholic queen with a Protestant one, suggests that religion does play a role in Wyatt's rebellion. Although Wyatt himself always tried to really play down and not, and not push the, the religious element, because he, he said for every, every person that might attract, there'll be multiple people that it would kind of turn away from the rebellion. Uh, and, but this also starts to build this connection with Catholic being connected with things which are foreign, in which case, in this point, Spain, that's just something that will really be re-emphasised re through Elizabeth's reign. Interestingly, there was no uh, rebellion against Mary's Catholic reforms and restoration of papal authority. Now, she did face opposition and was defeated in Parliament over the restoring of church lands, and there was a compromise where essentially um, the, the Pope agreed that the people could keep the land, but they wouldn't essentially receive religious forgiveness for it. And Mary's reign is captured in Fox's Book of Martyrs, which but notably is not published until the reign of Elizabeth. Uh, and certainly there were people who stood against Mary's, Mary's Catholic reforms and, and died because they stood against them. Um, but the vast, vast majority of the population are Catholic and actually returned, uh, welcomed the return to the, the old faith. Religion is again very important under Elizabeth. And Elizabeth famously is quite quoted as saying uh, that she didn't want a window into men's souls. Whether she actually ever said that is disputed, but this is, this is, a, is a, a, a position which is attributed to her. And that suggested that her religious reforms were not going to be as radical as those as her siblings. Her, her religious settlement of 1559 certainly created a Protestant church, but it was a fairly moderate one. And she you know, did things like she gave herself the title of Supreme Governor, not Supreme Head. Again, there was uh, arguments at the time about whether a woman could, could be head of the church. Um, and it had essentially a Protestant doctrine, but a lot of the stuff in the doctrine was fairly ambiguous. And therefore, if you wanted to make it fully Protestant, you could. And if you wanted to sail closer to old Catholic practices, then you could get away with a degree of that as well. And there were some Catholic practices that, that Elizabeth continue, uh, continued, such as uh, singing and the, and the way that priests were dressed. And, and, and so it, it wasn't a, a kind of harsh shift to a, a uh, Protestant church. And you'll, again, this is something you'd notice about Elizabethan Anglican, uh, Anglican church it, it is not, is, it, is, is not kind of the kind of puritanical uh, version of Protestantism. And so she faced 
opposition from Protestants as well as Catholics. So we see the Vesterian controversy, which is essentially argument from some of the clergy about whether whether they should wear what they saw as, as essentially um, Catholic vestments or Catholic clothing uh, when they're delivering services. Uh, uh, there's the ad admonitions to Parliament in 1572, uh, where again there's arguing about uh, there's, there's reforms and whether they they've not gone far enough and other things that should be changed. We've got Presbyterians who wanted to do away with uh, church structures, in particular bishops, and we see see a rise of them and, and other Puritans in the 1580s and into the into a degree into the 1590s. Now, Catholics, they attempted, first of all, to, to block um, the Acts of Supremacy and Uniformity. And we, we, we actually see a, a load of Catholic bishops locked in a room to stop them voting uh, on it at one point. And, and then the Catholics tended to, to sit and wait initially early on in Elizabeth's reign to see what happened. I mean, she, there was a crisis of, of 62 when she was really unwell and it was there was no named successor. Uh, and so it was unclear. Uh, what would happen next so was there much point fighting against this protestant monarchy wasn't going after the catholic population didn't want a window into men's souls who might not and, and she might well marry a catholic king or catholic man or she may she, she may be succeeded by someone who's catholic and so the, early on there's not an enormous push now that that changes with the northern uh, rebellion in 1569 um, she's excommunicated in 1570. Then, then we get the series of plots, such as the Rodolphi plot, the Throckmorton plot, the Parry plot, the Babington plot. And then we, we see the actions of seminary and Jesuit priests who were brought into the country and trying to, to reignite Catholicism, although in a lot of cases they didn't get um, much further than the manor houses of Catholic gentry and nobility. And if you've been round to some old Tudor, um, Tudor kind of um, stately homes, you might have, have been shown things like um, priest holes where there were kind of hidden rooms inside walls and things like that, where priests would hide in if the uh, priest catchers came. So in all of that, we can see discontent and, and disquiet about uh, Elizabeth's religious reforms on both sides. Uh, most notably um, from the Catholics, because, I mean, the Protestants are complaining about what kind of dress they have to wear to, to deliver services, whilst the Catholics are actually trying to kill Elizabeth. So there is a degree of difference, although there is opposition on both sides. The largest rebellion in terms of religious rebellion against Elizabeth is um, the Northern Rebellion. The Northern Earls, Northumberland and Westmoreland uh, were Catholic. Uh, Northumberland stated in 1572 that his motives were religious about restoring the Catholic uh, Church and, and protecting the personage of um, Mary Queen of Scots, but he was being interrogated at the time. Now, the, the Tudors believed that um, you, you only really got true confessions out of people when you tortured them. I, I don't think I would be of that mind. Um, one of the sparks for the rebellion was uh, the appointment of the Protestant Bishop uh, uh, Pilkington um, to the, the, the important um, position in Durham as Arch, uh, Archbishop in Durham, sorry, Bishop in Durham. Uh, and the, this was a, a kind of uh, a key a key element in starting, which again suggests religious causes. Um, the rebel proclamations were often focused on Catholic practices and the removal of Protestantism. Again, is that the genuine cause of the rebellion or they rallying cries that Northumberland and Westmoreland have worked out will help them raise the north against Elizabeth. So it might be the core, the, the, the reason why the, the, the ordinary people in the north are joining the, the rebellion rather than um, necessarily uh, the, the reason behind uh, the actual rebellion starting. Uh, the banner of the five wounds of Christ was displayed again, again, the sim you, you got s s uh, symbolism of, of religion as well. The true root of rebellion, however, is much debated, and th this is going to be the focus of our stuff that we're going to look at in AO3, where we're going to look at different historians' views. So there is, and again, this is worth doing some research into, there is a whole wide range of views into why the pilgrimage takes place, and some historians play up uh, the role of religion and some don't. So do your research and find out which ones say which, and that should help build, help you build some good argumentative paragraphs and also will help when we look at the stuff on AO3 in the autumn term. Thank you very much for watching. I, I hope that has helped. Obviously, this video sits alongside the one on socioeconomic causes and the one on political causes to help give you three sections or three different 
um, themes to look at in terms of what caused rebellions and discontent during the Tudor period. Um, there's much more available on my channel in terms of videos on coursework and doing all the key elements of coursework. Uh, there's a playlist on the Tudors, which has got loads of stuff on, on the Tudors. There's playlists on American history, on British history, on Russian history. And then there's also a huge swathe of stuff on A-level politics as well. So I hope this has been useful to you if you're studying Tudor Rebellion. And please uh, subscribe to the channel and check out the other playlists and see if there's other things uh, to help you with your interests uh, or your studies. Thank you very much again for watching.